Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our next module uh, on the four pillars, four pillars of destiny. But before we start, we can do a, uh, you know, a review of our last module, which was fairly intense. We did the eight trigrams. We did the bagua. We did the mingua. We did the barzai and we did the flying star. So how did you go? Did you have a chance to review the material and look at the exercises in the back of your workbook? Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> How many nervous breakdowns did you have? Three. Three? Four? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can add that, and that's that's no, that's a tantrum. That's not a that's not a that's not a nervous breakdown. So, would you like to just do a little quick review of uh, what we did in the last module? And if you got questions, so it goes like this: we we created the early heaven sequence first, and you're always going to recognise an early heaven sequence with heaven above and earth below and all of the trigrams are in opposition. And the numerical principles of the early heaven sequence, remember we counted the trigrams 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So we went from the most yang to the most yin and we changed those lines in in the frequency of just a little bit at a time. And we created the eight trigrams. And we noticed out of that that we are actually generating the number nine. All of those trigrams added up to nine. All of those lines in the early heaven sequence added up to nine. So we generated our later heaven sequence out of the early heaven sequence. Now remember the early heaven sequence you find at the first ring of every low pan compass. And you know there's not too many techniques that we're using the uh, early heaven sequence with. It's more associated with the yinzai or the houses of the dead. Right? But it's at the core of everything that we do. It's like the operating hardware of the universe. I mean essentially we, we started to discover what these trigrams represent. They are a, a numerical pattern of the macrocosm to the microcosm. So it's pretty powerful. And we notice that then each trigram has a, a body part, it has a season, it has one of the five elements associated with it. So that's stepped us into the Bagua. And the Bagua is pretty much in every feng shui book. Uh, that you'll come across. There's different techniques of using the Bagua. The Black Set tradition, which was generated by Professor Lin Yun, a Buddhist uh, 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 priest out of uh, Taiwan. In the uh, late 80s and early 90s, he started to teach in America the Black Set tradition, which is putting that Bagua on the, from the doorway of your house or the doorway of your room. And it's always going to line up at the bottom. So their bagua keeps on changing no matter what room they go into. If they come in the door here, that's always going to be, remember, their uh, wealth corner. And that one's always going to be their uh, relationship corner. So they put the bagua on like that. Right? Now, uh, uh, that became very, very popular in the States. Uh, people didn't really know uh, this tradition feng shui in the 90s at all. There wasn't hardly any books about it, and there was no books on classical feng shui. That's not the way they use it in China. What they use in China, what, what we call classical feng shui, is you will find the center of the room, or the house, and you will find magnetic north, 
and you will line up your bar gua with magnetic north with the water trigram. So then all of those trigrams are in synchronicity now with the eight directions and the Taoist calendar and the constellations. So it, it becomes a microcosm of a macrocosm. So we went through all of the eight trigrams, you learned the body parts, etc. And you also learned these energetic connotations that we have with the eight trigrams, like the house of fame and the house of creativity and career and relationships, etc. And there's extensive information on that in your workbook. And you can apply that bagua now to any situation, like in a, in a room. You can find the eight trigrams, 45 degrees. Now, in this workbook, there's some lovely uh, extra materials at the back of this workbook. Uh, for instance, at the very back, you're going to find some nice little uh, templates that you can practice your low pain compass. You can write in the trigrams, etc. And this becomes a lovely little compass that you can use. You can um, turn this into a transparency. And with a compass in the middle, you can easily just turn that around and line it up with north and south. And this is your 24 mountains, which we, we will review soon. And here's another lovely little compass that you can use with all the directions on here. And these are printouts of your eight bars I. So some lovely little printouts there. Now at the end of the course, I will give you uh, this as a PDF so you can print them out for your clients. So we got up to talking about uh, placing the bagua onto the house. Then we uh, looked at the Mingua system. So the Mingua is your destiny trigram associated with the eight uh, trigrams. So we created the Taoist calendar. And with the Taoist calendar, we created the whole sequence of time. And that calendar is what we're extensively going to be looking at uh, over the next four days, because that's the calendar that we use for the four pillars as well. So we created the 60 combinations out of heaven and earth. Now, we created the Mingua system by doing a calculation for our client. One was for the male, one was for the female, and then they would either become a member of the East Life Group or the West Life Group. So if they became a member of the East Life group, the numbers were 1, 3, 4, and 9, or water, wood, and fire trigrams. If they became a member of the West Life group, 2, 5, 8, 6, and 7, or the earth and, ele earth and metal elements. So they became a member of the West Life group, which is, remember, northwest, southwest, west, and, you know, west and southwest, northeast. So you've got four lucky directions for the west, four for the east. And then we did some practical exercises with that. We went, okay, if our client is an east life, here's a bedroom. Can, they, can we get, using the form school, a good position for the bed? Because if they align themselves with that direction, it supports their aura, it supports their energy frame a bit better because they are resonating more with those directions. And we also said it's not everything. You know, the, when we're applying these compass school situations, we're building it up from the ground up in the sense of the form where, where the desk, the window, you know, the wardrobes, etc. are very, very important considerations for us to get all of that right first. And then we can tweak it we can tweak it with these directions. And we learned how to apply the Mingua to an office. It was one of their facing directions. 
So we did several exercises with that, and you will, as a feng shui practitioner, just about every consultation you do, you will be able to do something with this. Now, when you're doing business feng shui, and there's a hundred people out there at the workstations, you don't use the mingua. You're not going to get everybody's lucky directions. Right? You mainly use this for people with their own you know, uh, uh, office, and their own desk, etc. Right? Now we also have the concept that's called the East and the West Life House. Do you remember that one? That's where we went, okay, now we have East and West Life people, and it's the same pattern of those trigrams, and we just apply it to a house now. And the reference for our house is the sitting direction of the house. So that's when we started to get into the more serious work of a feng shui practitioner. The definition of a feng shui practitioner through thousands and thousands of years of integration is to be able to recognize the sitting and facing direction of a dwelling. That's the first thing they do. So to really honor the system, you really need to know that uh, ability. You need to practice that ability. The orientation of a house. Right? So we talked about, you know, if it's facing the street, if it's facing the lake, if it's facing the river, where is the energy coming from? Then that's going to be more of the yang side, more exposure, more movement, more traffic, more people, and, you know, usually the facade of the building. And then the back, is going to be, remember, quiet and more contained and slower and heavier and, and it could even be a real mountain. So sitting on a mountain facing a lake. Right? Or the back garden facing the street. So that's a very, very important concept that we're going to be practicing in our next module, the practical module.